So in this video we're going to be covering acid-base reactions and for the most part we're going to be using the Bronsted-Lowry definition of acids and bases. That is to do with the transfer of protons where a proton donor is a Bronsted-Lowry acid. Likewise a proton receiver is a Bronsted-Lowry base. So you can see that the hydrofluoric acid right here would be a Bronsted-Lowry acid because it gives up its lone proton to join the hydronium over here leaving only a negative fluorine ion. And this negative fluorine ion is what is known as the conjugate base. That is the species left after a Bronsted-Lowry acid has given up its free proton in solution. So just as the negative fluorine ion is the conjugate base to the hydrogen fluoride Bronsted-Lowry acid over here, likewise because water acts as a base in this scenario, the hydronium which receives the lone proton is what is known as the conjugate acid to the water which in this case acts as a base not as a neutral. Now Bronsted-Lowry acid-base reactions like the one we have up here tend to act at equilibrium so they are in balance however the uh, forward and backwards reactions are both happening. So for each acid, let's say acid 1 would be the hydrofluoric acid over here, there is the conjugate base also working and likewise you have the second a or base rather and the corresponding acid over here. And these two reactions are fighting back and forth until they reach a point of equilibrium at which point they are uh, occurring at the same rate. And you'll notice that each acid, in this case, whether it be acid 1, the hydrofluoric acid, or acid 2, the hydronium, has uh, one more proton than its conjugate base. So the formula for an acid, let's say acid 2, the hydronium, is its conjugate base the water, which corresponds, because they're very similar chemically, plus an extra proton, which adds the extra charge and the extra hydrogen molecule. Moving on now to the strengths of conjugate acids and bases. The strengths have to do usually with the strength of the acid that you're put in. So hydrochloric acid is what is known as a strong acid. That is, it dissolves completely in solution. So when you dissolve it, it will give up its protons much more readily than say the hydronium over here and it's because of this reason that the chlorine can't take on protons and become hydrochloric acid again. It's just a lower energy state when it's dissolved like this. So the chlorine is what is known as a weak conjugate base. And a pattern you'll notice if you look at several reactions of this type is that for let's say a strong acid, it has a weak conjugate base, just as we have here. Likewise, if you were to have, let's say, a weak acid, the reaction would be very reversible and you would have a strong conjugate base that could take on the hydrogen ions again. And the same is true of bases and their conjugate acids. All it is is it depends on which side of the equation you have as the products versus the reactants. Now this idea of strong versus weak acids and their conjugate strong and weak, weak acid and base counterparts uh, allows you to predict the outcomes of some reactions. So for example over here we have perchloric acid which we know is a strong acid and because it's a strong acid we know that the ion it forms or the anion rather is a weak conjugate base. Now water in this instance asks, acts as a stronger base than the uh, perchlorate ion. Now this means that it will compete more strongly for the free protons in solution and therefore accept more of them. And as a general rule what ends up happening is that reactions will proceed such that they go from strong acids and bases to products that are weaker acids and bases. So in this case we know that the reaction will proceed more in the direction 
of hydronium and perchlorate than it will backwards in the direction of perchloric acid and water. Now in order to know which acid or base is stronger than the other, let's say you have to look at some sort of chart of which has you know the strong acids up here and the weak acids down here. Luckily on page 485 there's a fantastic chart of most of the acids and bases and more that we'll be using in the class along with their conjugates in order of the acid and base strength. Now referencing that chart on page 485 you can now solve the below equation to determine which direction the reaction will proceed. All you have to know is the given strengths of the reactants and products. So let's start over here. We see that we have acetic acid and acetic acid is a weaker base or a weaker acid rather than the hydronium. So we mark this as a strong acid and because the strength is on this side we'll look over here to see if the acetate ion is a stronger base than the water and if you look at the chart you'll see that it is indeed the stronger base making this the weak base and the weak acid and because we know that the bronsted lowry acid base reactions will tend to go from strong acids and bases towards the weak acids and bases we can determine that this reaction will proceed to the left that is going from the strong hydronium and acetate ions over to the weaker acetic acid and water. Now in the last few problems you may have heard me say that water acts as a base in this situation and the reason I have to specify that is because water is what is known as an amphoteric compound. Now amphoteric compounds are compounds that can act as both a base and an acid depending on the situation. For example, in the first reaction we have here, uh, sulfuric acid is a strong acid and it's therefore stronger than water. So in this case the water will accept the proton making it a bronsted lowry base. However, if you were to have a situation like down here where the water is a stronger acid than the ammonia is, then the water will act as an acid and the ammonia will act as a base. And you can see that when water acts as a base and takes on this proton, its conjugate acid is the hydronium ion. Similarly, if water acts as the stronger acid and surrenders a proton, leaving it with only one hydrogen, it has a conjugate base of a hydroxide ion. So now we're moving on we're going to be talking about neutralization and neutralization happens all the time for example if you have an over acidic stomach you can take an antacid like Tums or whatever to sort of uh, mellow down the acid in your stomach. Now there are also strong acid strong base neutralizations like this reaction which I've done as an example before but if you'll remember in an aqueous solution when you put you know hydrochloric acid or sodium hydroxide in it dissociates into their respective ions so you get the hydronium the chlorine sodium and hydroxide or hydroxyl group rather all separated apart they're no longer linked by this covalent bond and what happens is that when you combine the two together the hydroxide ion will take its extra proton and then donate it or the hydronium ion rather will donate it to the hydroxyl group and what ends up happening as you can see is if you eliminate this you end up with two hydrogens and an oxygen and your charge goes back to neutral similarly once you add this hydrogen over here the proton then you get the extra hydrogen you need and you cancel out this negative so that you get a neutral atom. So a neutralization reaction is simply when two strong acids get together and their constituent 
hydronium and hydroxyl groups combine together completely to form water. Now if you were to finish out this reaction you would get two molecules of water plus the sodium ion still in solution and the chlorine ion still in solution. So because these chlorine ions and the sodium ions didn't get used, remember they're what are known as spectator ions, but if you were to put them back together, let's say you were to dry out the whole solution, you would get NaCl, table salt. And you'll notice that in many neutralization reactions where you form this water out of the hydronium and hydroxyl, you will end up with some sort of salt, that is with an alkali or alkaline earth metal and a halogen as a compound in the result. So just to end the video, we're going to talk really quickly about acid rain. Now acid rain happens when pollution from factories or chemical plants or whatever containing compounds like nitrogen and carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, etc. In this case, we have sulfur trioxide coming out of these clouds. What happens is that these chemicals will float up into the atmosphere as gases and little particles in the air and come and join clouds, that is, clouds are made of water, remember, and what will end up happening is they'll react to form acid. Now this acid tends to be usually in very low concentration compared to the rest of the cloud, but once the cloud becomes heavy enough, you know, it'll start to rain down, and this is a problem because Acid rain can change uh, the composition of lakes and burn trees and forests and even it's been seen to you know wear away at asphalt. So uh, scientists have had to change amendments in like the 70s Clean Air Act in the 90s and etc to stop things like this acid rain from forming dangerous acids within the atmosphere.